Hi everyone, I'm going to talk about Roth versus traditional and specifically I'm going to talk about a very prevalent myth. Um, I tried to explain this yesterday and I thought I had done a good job and my math is still correct but I've come to terms with the fact that I did not do a good job explaining it. And ultimately my goal is to help you make a better decision about your money. So I'm going to go through this again. Uh, this is a myth that I personally used to believe, and it's easy to see why, okay? I'm, I apologize, I only have a red marker. But if you contribute $10,000 today, okay, and it grows 1,000%, then you're going to end up with $110,000 in retirement, right? So that's 1,000% growth plus your original $10,000, you end up with $110,000. That's your final balance. Well... If you're doing traditional, you pay tax on this amount. If you're doing Roth, you pay tax on this amount. So a lot of people look at this and conclude, I'd rather pay tax on $10,000 than $110,000. And that's true, but it doesn't help you make the decision between Roth and traditional, and that's what I'm going to demonstrate, okay? It is absolutely true that you pay more tax if you do the traditional route. You pay tax on the ending balance after the growth. You're going to pay more tax. But in an equal comparison, the extra tax you're paying is offset because you're going to end up with a larger account balance than an equivalent Roth account. And that's what I need to prove to you. Okay, so we're going to have two employees, Jack Roth and Jill Traditional. Okay, these two employees make exactly the same amount of money. And they're both going to contribute $10,000 in any given calendar year, okay? We're only going to look at the $10,000. I'm not going to bring into it their existing account balance. That just muddies the waters and it's not helpful. Both of these people are going to contribute $10,000. I'm sorry. I know this would be better with different colors but I only have a red marker, so that's what I'm going with, okay? Jack, now, both of these people make the same amount of money, they're in the same tax bracket. For this purpose, we're going to assume they're in the 22% tax bracket, which means Jack is paying 22% on all of that $10,000. I understand that tax rates are progressive, but because his TSB contribution is basically at the top of his pile, he's paying 22% on all of his contribution, okay? So his tax is $2,200. If you use 22%, 22% of $10,000 is $2,200, okay? Jill is traditional, so right now she's not paying any tax, which means Jack's out-of-pocket is $12,200, and Jill's out-of-pocket is only $10,000. And that's why these two contributions are not equivalent. And I understand if I had used percentage of their salary, this number will be the same. The top number will be the same. But Jack is still paying more money in tax. He's still paying more money out of pocket, even if you use percentages. If you use 5% and they make $200,000 each, 5% of that is 10 grand, right? And 5% of 200 grand is $10,000. If it's percentage, yes, they will have the same amount of money going into their account. What's different is the amount of money that's coming out of their pocket. And therefore, 
Jack is fundamentally spending more money on his retirement right now than Jill is. And so this is a flawed comparison. In order to make an equal comparison, you have to assume that Jill is going to contribute the same amount of money that Jack is paying in taxes. That way, they're both spending the same amount of money out of their pocket on their retirement accounts right now. So if you do that, then the scenario changes. If Jill contributes $12,200 to her account balance, then she will have a total out of pocket of $12,200 for the year. And this is a critical point here because they're spending the same amount of money on their retirement, but Jill has a larger balance, okay? And when you propagate that out, if you assume that both of them have exactly the same growth rate, meaning they invest in the exact same TSP funds, come retirement, if you use that same 1,000% growth we used earlier, then Jack's account will have a balance of $110,000. Okay, Jill's account, on the other hand, because her balance was actually higher to begin with, Jill's account with the exact same 1,000% growth will end up at $134,200, okay? Yes, Jill has to pay tax on this amount. Jack does not have to pay tax on this amount. But, you see, because Jill's account is so much larger, that pretty much makes up for the tax, the extra tax that she has to pay. She's going to pay more tax than, than Jack did. Jack only paid $2,200. She's going to pay tax on this amount. Now, people also said that I did this wrong, okay? I'm assuming for the purpose of comparing traditional to Roth, I am making the assumption that in retirement, both of these people have a baseline income from FERS and Social Security that pushes them back into that same tax bracket. And I know that doesn't meet most cases, but I'm doing it because the point I'm trying to make, okay? So if she pays 22% tax on $134,200, that's $29,000 in tax. Specifically, it's $29,524, okay? And this is tax that she's paying out over several years because I know if she withdrew all that in one year, it would go up, all right? We're assuming that she's taking these withdrawals out year to year to year to year, and eventually she withdraws her entire account and all of it is hit in the 22% bracket. Again, that does not necessarily meet your case, but I'm trying to make a point about Roth versus traditional, okay? So she's paying this much tax, and after all that tax is paid, the amount of money that she gets in retirement is $104,676. So, at this point, none of this other stuff matters. Jack was contributing $10,000 to his balance, paying $2,200 in tax, which means his out-of-pocket each year was $12,200. Jill, on the other hand, was contributing a larger amount to her balance. She was contributing $12,200, but she paid no tax, and her out-of-pocket was exactly the same. But because her balance was higher, she ended up with a much larger balance in retirement, which was enough, pretty much, to pay for the extra tax. So, to boil this down to a conclusion here,
Sorry, I erased their names. I didn't mean to do that. But basically, after paying tax, remember we just came up, she had $104,000 and 676, okay? And Jack had $110,000. This is after all taxes paid. All taxes paid, okay? The money has been withdrawn, all of it contributed in the 22% bracket, all of it withdrawn in the 22% bracket, and the difference is smaller than you think because the traditional balance is about 5% lower than the Roth balance. It's very close. 5% is, is a lot of money, don't get me wrong, okay? The entire point of this exercise was to prove that you shouldn't look at that very beginning thing where we said, I would rather pay tax on $10,000 than pay tax on $100,000. That is kind of short-sighted. You really have to look at the whole picture and understand not how much tax you're gonna pay, but how much money are you going to have in retirement after that tax is paid. And because they're closer than people think, I really wanna hammer home the next point you must compare your tax brackets now to your expected tax brackets in retirement. And that's where it gets different for each person. Yes, Roth wins by about 5% if you retire in exactly the same bracket as you did when you were working. But if you retire in even one tax bracket lower, even one, it could be enough to make up for that 5% difference easily. And because we have a progressive scale, okay, on the left, this is tax brackets. I'm going to make them up. I don't have these memorized, okay? We're going to say this is the 10% th line, this is the 18% line, and this is the 22% line. I don't have the exact tax brackets in front of me. These are approximations to show, okay, this is working years working if you're up here and working and you're making a lot of money this mostly applies to people right at the end of their career right they're making a fortune because they've had promotions but if they're going to retire down here where they have first gets them up to this level and then they stack social security on top of that and then it gets them up to that well the third level on top of this unless you have other income, is your TSP withdrawals, okay? So if you're contributing to the TSP over here, you actually want, if you're expecting that your tax is gonna go down in retirement, what you wanna do is basically you're cutting this column if you do traditional. If you do traditional, you're cutting this column, you're taking this money, and you're saying, I'm gonna move that to retirement, and I'm gonna pay tax on it when I'm in a lower bracket. And if you run the numbers, and I recommend you do it with a CPA, somebody who's very good at this, you can easily find that traditional might be the best course of action for you. You might end up with way more money after all taxes are paid if you go the traditional route. And I would estimate that this is probably the case for people who have been contributing nothing or 5% to their TSP for their entire careers. Most likely, and you need to look at it, but most likely your first pension and social security is going to add up to significantly less than you make toward the end of your career. And therefore you should be in traditional. Now the opposite is also true. If you're a person like myself who invests heavily in their TSP, for decades and invest in equities, then your resulting TSP balance is going to be massive. And what you can actually do, we're gonna look at the opposite of this right here, okay? So say, even if I'm like a GS5, all right, and in this hypothetical situation, I'm only making this much money at the very end of my career. Well, because I've done such an aggressive job of managing my TSP, this third stack 
Well, if I'm making less money, the two these two stacks are going to be shorter. So I'll draw that real quick. Even though I'm a low wage employee, okay, here's my FERS, it's shorter, right? Here's my social security, also shorter. But because I've been contributing the maximum amount to my TSP for 20 years and I invested it in stocks and I made a great deal of money in retirement, my TSP could make up 90% of my income because I get to decide how much of my TSP I'm gonna withdraw. And in this case, I would wanna do Roth. Because what I do is like, hey, I'm not paying very much tax right now on my income. I can stack the TSP on there. So I'm paying, you know, 10 to 18% on my TSP contribution up front. And that allows me to shorten this stack. I get the same amount of money in retirement, but I'm paying less tax. This is taxable income. And therefore, this column can be shorter. In fact, if I do all Roth, that column goes away entirely. And then the only thing I have to pay tax on is FERS and Social Security. Again, just a quick summary. The whole point of this video is that if somebody tells you, why would you want to pay tax on your earnings? What they are saying is technically true, but it is not a good basis for deciding if you should do Roth or traditional. You need to figure out what your expected tax rate in retirement is and compare it to the tax rate you have now and the tax rate you're going to have over the course of your career. And keep in mind that state taxes, state income taxes play a big role here if you're planning on moving in retirement. Many people work in states that have state income tax and end up retiring in states that don't. And in that case, your tax rate now is almost certainly much higher and therefore you should do traditional. If the opposite is true, if right now you work in a state that doesn't have state income tax, but in retirement you wanna move somewhere that does have state income tax and that state income tax happens to tax um, 401k or TSP accounts, then you would want to do the opposite. You would want to take advantage of the less tax you're paying now in a tax-free state, okay? Another consideration for people in the military, if you are in a combat zone, you ha you're effectively in a tax-free zone and you should absolutely 100% positively be contributing to Roth while you are in a tax-free zone because then that money, it will grow completely tax-free and you never paid it tax on it to begin with. That is a no-brainer. And that concludes the video. Thank you.